just doing it, just growing things and experimenting and trying to figure out what we wanted to do, I totally fell in love with it. It was the first time in my entire life I could actually say that I was passionate about something. Um, I was actively seeking out new information, researching without having to do it for my job. It was something I just loved to do. Um, so now the end goal has ultimately become a permaculture. Uh, and then again, just for people who aren't familiar with the term, permaculture is essentially a philosophy um, of working with rather than against nature. So it's, it's centered on like whole systems um, so that the system self-regulates itself. It's, it's using plants and animals in their natural state with their natural tendencies uh, to create a harmony um, so that we don't have to utilize more of our own manpower to try and control these things. It just happens on its own. Um, so lo and behold, <laughs> the more we started to learn and grow, the more we were able to provide for ourselves and then the more fulfilled, the more content, the more satisfied we became. So um, I think it's important to note as well that appreciation was, uh, was and is a key attribute of homesteading. Um, it provides another element that brings more contentment. So for example, we, we live a, uh, an hour round trip from the nearest grocery store right now. So when I lived in suburbia where I could just walk two minutes to the end of the road and have a coffee shop and a restaurant and a grocery store right there. Um, I just, I never appreciated what modern conveniences afforded me. Um, living here now, I, I recognize it. And, and on the flip of that, living so far away from these conveniences also gives me an appreciation for what we have here. So because I can't throw out food anymore, uh, or sorry, because I can't pop out to uh, the grocery store to buy what I feel like, I I'm not throwing out as much food anymore. Um, a large portion of our food sitting in our fridge and freezer and pantry shelves, they were grown on our, our property. Like I painstakingly cared for these, these, this, this food, um, for, for months over a long period of time. So that jar of tomato sauce that used to cost what, between three and $5 and maybe 10 minutes of my time when I would pop out to the grocery store, uh, is, is now worth that much more. Um, because I see the value that goes into it. I see the months of hard work from growing it from seeds, the months of hard work of protecting it from weather and bugs to make sure it actually produces. Um, and then, all the effort that goes into harvesting, making the sauce, ensuring they're jarred properly to be shelf stable for the year. Um, you know, appreciation for what we, we already have. When we first moved into 27 acres, that was my first experience, not living in a newly built or newly renovated home. Um, the first night we were here, I had an epiphany, which made me recognize that I had let, led a very sheltered and very privileged life with not that much hardship in it. Um, our, our home was unsafe initially to live in. There was mold and six inches of gray water sitting in our bathtub. We quite literally had like plant life growing through our pipes up through our sinks. Um, there was bugs everywhere. There was mice feces everywhere. But after we did the basic fixes and we got the house to a safe living condition, it was quite comfortable. So all these like major renovations and gut jobs that we thought we were going to have to do to like bring the house into the modern century, they became irrelevant and unimportant. Um, and, and so by investing less time and money and energy into what we've dubbed the aesthetically pleasing things, um, we've been able to devote more time and money and energy into developing our homesteads. So instead of renovating the kitchen, we built this 30 by 50 foot greenhouse and, and an additional 1500 square feet of outdoor gardens. Instead of spending the time picking out new appliances, that freed up time for me to care for our laying hens that provide us fresh daily eggs. Um, we, we, ended up paying more attention to developing our property for self-sufficiency and permaculture instead of filling it with the lovely material things. 
So now we raise our own chickens and ducks for meat. Um, we have, we raise chickens for eggs, as I previously mentioned. We have 25 beehives on our property. Um, we've built brooder boxes and picnic tables, outhouses, uh, compost bins, irrigation systems, rain barrels. Um, as I mentioned, the greenhouse and the gardens. Uh, we now make and bottle our own honey maple syrup, uh, tomato sauces, pickles, apple sauces, bone broth stocks, the list is endless. Um, so I myself have gone from not knowing how to boil an egg, like that is, that is quite literally true. In my early 20s, I used to have to call my mom to, for her to tell me how to hard boil an egg. Um, and, and now I can make most of my meals from scratch. Um, I can use power tools, I can do basic auto repair. Um, I've gone from not being able to boil an egg to growing my own produce and preserving it and rendering fat for cooking. So ultimately we just ended up consuming less here and repurposing more. Um, as so previously mentioned, um, I did have zero pre-existing knowledge to any of this before, um, before we moved here. Um, I fail often and frequently. Uh, I went, well, the first fall we moved in here, we had a flock of laying hens that I let live their best chicken life, completely free range across the 27 acres. But uh, our fencing was lacking. And one day I went outside to check on them and there was just feathers everywhere. It became very clear very quickly that they had been taken out by a pack of coyotes. Um, so we want to talk about failing. In my previous life, my biggest failure would be going into a meeting and bombing it. And out here, 13 chickens lost their life because of a mistake that I made. So it, it's, it's horrible to be responsible for that loss of life. But the other side of that is that's what makes doing this all so satisfying. I'm, I'm constantly and consistently pushed beyond my comfort zone. You know, I'm, I'm forced to learn new things and apply them in different ways. Um, I fail, <laughs> I fall, uh, and there's just no choice. You just have to get up the next day and keep doing it. Um, that is to me what causes personal growth and development. And that is what I lacked in my previous lifestyle. I was so afraid to touch anything that I wasn't certain I'd succeed at that I was stagnant. Um, so that's basically just a little history of who I am and how we came to be here. Um, but uh, recognizing that um, urban farming or urban agriculture is really taking off, especially during the current times we're living in, um, where people have more flexibility and time and also just out of curiosity. Um, it, it, urban agriculture is really taking off. There, there's people growing food in like the most improbable places, like rooftops and and windowsills and balconies and like whatever nook and cranny they can find. So I did just want to. Um, oh, I see. There's a question. How does it work in the winter when you can't grow anything? Yes. So that is a huge thing uh, that we do here. We grow everything in um, in the summer months spring and summer months and I grow in abundance and then we either jar or freeze and to preserve preserve to get through the winter um, we've also come up with some other little creative things we had a, a one of our fridges go um, and so we've actually decided we're burying that into the ground and we'll use that as our cold storage so you can actually keep your carrots and any kind of root vegetable, as long as it stays cold enough, it'll last all year. In fact, a lot of the carrots you're currently buying at the grocery store in the spring are from last year's harvest. Um, so that, that we do, we do preserve everything we possibly can. Um, Trav, did I hear you right? You're putting a fridge in the ground and that's gonna be a cold storage? Yeah, yeah. Right. now we're bearing, it's like a, a makeshift cold storage, essentially. It'll be, uh, it, we're gonna do it in the greenhouse so we have easy access to it through the winter. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the plan. <laughs> and then I, I just got a private message for you. Um, and how do you know what you can freeze and what you can preserve? So knowing which vegetables you're growing, like what takes a while to the freezer? Yeah, it's, it's actually shocking how much stuff keep, you can freeze. So a lot of things that you end up freezing aren't good fresh. So for example, 
spinach, spinach and kale. That's something you can freeze really easily. Um, but you could never defrost it and have a salad with it. That just wouldn't work. But it's great in smoothies, in stews, um, in soups, anything like that. So generally through the summer, we're eating all of the greens as they come. And then my last few harvests, those all go directly into the freezer. So we harvest, wash clean, dry, um, and flash freeze, and then it gets packaged and put into our, our freezer. Um, but it is, it is shocking the amount of things you can freeze. We freeze zucchini, um, peas, beans, uh, broccoli, cauliflower, um, even onions that are starting to go bad, you can dice those up. Bell peppers, we, um, we slice or dice, so I have different kinds. Same thing with carrots, we can grate and uh, chop, dice, however you, however you are gonna use it the most, that's how you can uh, preserve it in the freezer. Yeah. I just have one more question. Yeah. And it says, I, I probably never buy 27 acres. However, how can I do it in my city house? Yes. So there are, um, there are so many things you can grow in pots and containers. Um, generally, as a rule of thumb, if you're going to be growing things in a smaller setting, look for dwarf or hybrid varieties. Um, you still get the same amount of produce from those plants. It's just the plant itself is more compact, so it will take up less space. Um, another rule of thumb is uh, generally look for deeper pots, like you're looking for about 12 inches. Um, for most things, herbs and lettuces um, and your leafy greens, they won't need as much space. You're probably looking at about six to eight inches deep for that. Um, and, and then there are like lettuce, all varieties of lettuce, they don't need a ton of sunlight to grow. Um, so you can grow them on windowsills where they're only going to get light for half of the day versus a tomato plant, which tomatoes actually thrive in containers. They do really, really well in containers, but they do require a lot of sunlight. Um, so you just need to make sure you're positioning your plants where they're going to be getting what they need to produce the best. Um, one of the other ones I, I had noted down was um, sweet or hot peppers. The plants are actually beautiful. The flowers that grow off of these plants are absolutely stunning. And they're also self-pollinating flowers. So they don't actually need insects or bugs to be able to produce. A little gentle shake or wind and they'll self-pollinate and you'll, you'll get produce. You just need to make sure that they, they keep them in a, in a warm spot. Um, so like I said, I, do, I didn't have any of this information. All of this information comes from research. So if it's something you actively want to do, it, the, the, the information is at your fingertips. You just have to uh, find it really, that's all it is. Okay, that's it for questions for right now. So sorry, go ahead. Keep questions, going. yeah. No, that's uh, it for questions, keep going. That, no, that's good. The only other thing I would say is if you're gonna grow in pots, um, the first season you're fine with like a triple mix. Um, but if you want to keep repurposing that soil year over year, you're going to have to add some sort of organic ma matter to it. Um, my personal favorites are either compost um, or worm castings. You can get both of that at any typical garden center. Um, there's also an organic fertilizer called Gaia Green. It's an all-purpose fertilizer. Uh, you can mix that into your soil and you can continue to use that triple mix over and over and over again as long as you keep feeding it. That's it. Did anyone else have any other questions? Because I know we're, we're running short. So I have some other things I can say, but I just wanted to answer questions if they came up. Yeah, go ahead and I'll prompt you. Okay, perfect. Um, another fun thing that you can grow at home um, in a smaller space, it will require more space than say um, a, um, a cucumber plant or a pepper plant, but potatoes. Potatoes are actually something you can grow at home very, very easily. You can get um, burlap sacks. Uh, I mean, people have done so many creative things. You can stack boxes on top of each other. And essentially with potatoes, um, as they grow, you keep adding soil and they keep coming up and they keep producing potatoes as they go down. But they are 
super happy plants in, um, in containers and one plant will provide an immense amount of food. Um, tomatoes are another one, as I previously mentioned, one tomato plant on average produces about 10 pounds of fruit for the season. So, I mean, this is where it took me coming here to recognize that I could have been doing this in my very teeny tiny backyard in Calgary. I could have easily grown a, a large component of what we ate for our family of four in a very, very small space. Um, that was a cucumber beetle for anyone wondering that just flew by <laughs> stacking my plants. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, um, utilizing your space most efficiently. So decide for yourself what it is that you would most enjoy to grow. Um, and then go from there, start small and experiment. It's, it's the most satisfying, most rewarding thing I've ever done. Do you have a tip? Actually, you just made a good point with that bug flying near you. Yeah. How do you protect your plants? So even if, if we did them in our home, is there something that you use to protect them? So there are different things. There are like row covers or plant covers that you can put over top. Um, I haven't had much luck with them. And part of that is because where we live, it's like there's, there's wind turbines everywhere here. It's so windy that I can't get my row covers to stay put. They end up billowing off. The other problem with that is that they are very um, manual. So you have to take them on and off at different points during the day because uh, a lot of these plants need to be pollinated by bees and insects in order to produce. So if you have them covered, then the pollinators can't get, the, the bad bugs can't get in, but the pollinators also can't get in. Um, so I do a lot of manual hand picking. So like the cucumber beetle, I spend most of my mornings smushing them. <laughs> picking them off the plant, killing them, or um, there's a tomato hornworm that is especially vile. They will decimate a tomato plant in a day. Uh, and it's, all of these pests are very obvious. You'll come out and you'll see your plant all of a sudden has holes everywhere on it. And generally, if the plant is well established enough, it's not a problem. You just need to get rid of the pest at that point. Um, but I, I drown the, those caterpillars or feed them to my chickens but in, in, in uh, an urban setting where you don't have chickens, drowning the caterpillars would be perfectly suitable. But it is, it's just paying attention. That's really it. You just have to watch your plant and see what's happening. There's one right here. Oh, gone. We have a quick question just before we wrap up. Um, what are the plants that are growing behind you and how many hours a day do you spend uh, tending to the gardens? All right, so these guys right here, those are my um, tomato plants. These are actually indeterminate, which means they're going to fruit and ripen sporadically, consistently throughout the season. Versus in the back, I have Roma tomatoes, which they will all fruit and ripen at once, and those will become my sauce. Um, I also have some cucumbers and a honeydew cantaloupe, my bell peppers and my zucchini and a strawberry patch. That's all in my greenhouse. And then everything else I grow is outdoors. I can do a little spin here. There's one of the gardens. I'm not sure if you can see, but. We can, that's super cool. Yeah, so that's, um, and then how many hours? I generally get up in the morning and I bring my coffee out here and my husband spends the morning with, our two daughters while he's getting ready for work um, and I come out to the gardens I'll probably spend about an hour out here in the morning um, and then after bedtime I'll come out here and I'll probably spend another hour um, but we are also growing an abundance of food to be able to get us through the winter as well so when you have a smaller scale it's completely, it, it correlates completely with how much time you have to put into it. Cool. Okay, if you could leave us with one thing, obviously I've shared your Instagram. Um, maybe I guess, what can they find on your Instagram? What will be helpful to them? Yeah, so what I've started to do, and I actually did this more for myself, more than anyone else, was um, I started to document what needs to be done at different times of the season. So for example, when the cucumber beetle became 
apparent and prevalent. Um, I document on my Instagram what the cucumber beetle is, what they'll do, um, and how to take care of it. Um, and then for myself, next year around this time, when I get served my memory, it'll be a, ah, I have to be on the lookout for the cucumber beetle or, oh, I was doing that this time this year. It also gives me a time frame of where we are in the season. So this year, um, we got all that really cold weather after that huge heat wave where it was dropping below zero overnight. Um, it affected my plants. It, 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 we had to baby them for a while. So now they're further behind than they were last year. So it's just like interesting to see that kind of, uh, the year over year progression of things. Um, but ultimately I had a bunch of friends who kept asking me questions. And so this was a way, a nice way for me to compile everything and have people be able to access it whenever they needed it. Sorry, okay. I'm sweating. No, I know, that's hot. hot here. We have kind of a rainy day here. Okay, then the last question, approximately, uh, how much do you need to grow per person to get through the year? Um, so every plant will, uh, it, it, it depends on the plant and how well it's doing. So um, an asparagus plant, for example, um, generally if you have two crowns per person, that will be enough to get you through the asparagus season. Um, and then, so that's actually an interesting thing that we, we did here. We started to note how many jars we would go through a year how many onions we would go through a year so that then in the following year, I know what I need to plant more of um, or less of. So for example, last year I planted way too many parsnips and not enough carrots. So I had a full bed devoted to parsnips and a full bed devo devoted to carrots. Well, my family likes carrots far more than they like parsnips. So this year that's been scaled back. Um, and, and every family is gonna be different, but like one tomato plant that would serve a, a small family of four, likely. Um, uh, one cucumber plant, that will serve a, fall, a small family of four. Um, pepper, sweet bell uh, peppers, they only produce about two or three or two to four peppers per plant. So you might want four of those. Um, but again, it's just paying attention to what your family wants and then going for that. That's super helpful. I'm excited. I'm going to try a tomato plant. Am I too late, Chelsea? <laughs> Is it too well, late? not if you got a seedling. <laughs> Seed, yeah, you'd be uh, SOL, but. All right, well, we'll try next year. Okay, this was awesome. I mean, um, these are going to all be recorded all the same today. So uh, your, this knowledge is going to be passed on and continuously watched throughout the next couple of months, which is awesome. So thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you guys so much for having me and for dealing with me sweating so profusely through all of this. In a greenhouse, it's, you win. Um, but also I actually like the spin that it's not just a lifestyle in terms of something you decide to do, but it, it's also the experience that you went through to get to where you are. So. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's why I said like like coming to such a large property made me recognize that there was so much I could have been doing in my current situation to repurpose, to waste less, to do all of these things. It it was just it, it took me coming here. So homesteading isn't a lifestyle like just like where you are. It's more of a mentality, right? It's it's, it's uh, consuming less and repurposing more and being more self sufficient. Yeah, that's very cool. So you can find our Instagram, the link is post. If you have any additional questions you wanna go further in. And uh, that's the conclusion of our summer market today. So for all the different sessions that you joined, thanks so much for joining in and hopefully you learned something and, and you have something to do in this, I guess, weird summer. You know, it's a weird summer and now we have things to kind of keep us busy. So, and Chelsea, thank you very, very much again. Thanks for joining us from Pawnee Pool and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye everyone, thanks.